Hi, this is Joe Loria. Before you watch our latest episode of CN Live, I just wanted to thank you, the viewers and readers of Consortium News, for your past generosity in funding our unique website. It was begun 25 years ago, in November 1995, by Bob Perry, one of the best investigative reporters in American journalistic history. Bob depended on readers as well for the independence that Consortium News has always had. And during these days of crisis and pandemic and the crisis in journalism with Julian Assange languishing in prison, we ask you to support us through these tough times so that we can continue to bring you these special stories, a unique perspective on news that you won't find in corporate media. Thank you. Get out your notebook. Welcome to CM Live, Season 2, Episode 9, Russiagate, Who Was Guccifer 2.0? I'm Joe Loria, Editor-in-Chief of Consortium News. And I'm Elizabeth Voss. For more than three years now, the American public and indeed the world has been subjected to a lurid tale of Russian skullduggery, a covert interference in a U.S. election intended to determine the next U.S. president. It was a so-called attack likened to Pearl Harbor and 9-11. This theory of conspiracy rested on three pillars, that Russian GRU defense intelligence agents posing as a shadowy online figure named Lucifer 2.0 had hacked into the DNC computers and the email database of Hillary Clinton's campaign chairman. And the Russians gave these emails to WikiLeaks to publish in order to damage Clinton's candidacy. Another pillar was that members of the Trump campaign conspired or colluded with Russians to do this. And lastly, that a Russian troll farm undermined U.S. democracy, divided our country with $100,000. All three pillars have now collapsed. Robert Mueller's report last year found no collusion or conspiracy between Russia and the Trump campaign. Sean Henry, the head of CrowdStrike, testified two years ago behind closed doors to the House Intelligence Committee that there was no evidence of any exfiltration or extraction of material from the DNC computers that they were brought in to look at, as opposed to the FBI. And the Russian troll farm accused of dividing the country with a few ads actually demanded discovery in their case against the US government, and therefore the US case collapsed. Here to discuss these new developments that have come about in the last few <laughs> days, is Ray McGovern, a former CIA analyst who briefed Presidents George H.W. Bush and Ronald Reagan, and William Binney, who is a former technical director of the National Security Agency. We welcome both Bill and Ray to the show. And I want to begin by discussing some new information or a new analysis of the persona of Guccifer 2.0 in an article written by Tim Leonard that was published on Consortium News just a few days ago. So I want to turn that over to my co-host, Elizabeth Hoss. Ray, Bill, I assume that you've had time to read Tim Leonard's latest article published with Consortium News on Gooseper 2. Uh, Ray, can I get your thoughts? And then, Bill, I'd like to have your thoughts as well on that article and, and the plethora of information that it contains. All I can say is that Tim has delivered a masterful article with technical detail that even a history major like me can understand, okay? <laughs> He's put it all together. <laughs> And it's not like it's a, a bright dawning star for us. Uh, uh, Bill Binney and I have been saying for months and months and months, the case for 2.0 is a fraud, an out and out fraud, and we can prove it. The question of exactly who he, she, or it, that we use uh, non-sexist uh, language with respect to Guccifer 2.0, uh, who it is, well, you know, it's, it's somebody, look at uh, Kui Bono, who, who profits? who profits from uh, laying the blame on the Russians. Uh, the recent uh, information in Tim Leonard's article includes information that, that uh, one couldn't believe uh, that uh, Guzifer II would say, like, what about the Russian connection? Or trying to probe for what, what indeed uh, WikiLeaks had. In other words, they knew, because Julian Assange announced it on the 12th of June, 2016, that, as he put it, we have emails related to Hillary Clinton pending publication, 
period. Okay. So everybody in the world who's paying attention <laughs> knew that WikiLeaks had that data. So where does Christopher 2.0 come onto the, well, he comes on three days later. He says, oh yeah, well, yeah, we, we, we approve of what CrowdStrike has just said. This is a Russian, Russian deal. And I won't belabor the point, but, but Tim Leonard mm. uh, goes into uh, chapter and verse about how uh, this data was manipulated with Russian footprints and everything else to indicate that the Russians hacked. And now we know from testimony from the head of Troutscribe <laughs> that the Russians mm. didn't hack the DNC emails. Nobody hacked the DNC email. They weren't exfiltrated as the 35 cent word. They weren't hacked, okay? It was an inside job, which again, Bill and I have been saying for three years now. Bill, yeah. your take. Well, yeah, I, I think uh, Tim was just adding more fuel to the fire of the Russians didn't really do it. I mean, uh, what we found, of course, was that when the testimony from the, from the DNI came, was released by the DNI, of uh, Henry's testimony to the uh, House Intelligence Committee, I mean, he clearly said that we had, uh, we had no evidence that the data was exfiltrated. And yet in public, he was saying the Russians did it. Well, you know, from our point, just from the straight calculations we did, uh, in, and we said in our article on the 24th of July in 2017, that uh, the speed was just too great to go across the net. So it had to be a local download. Uh, and that was basically uh, what CrowdStrike said. And then <clears throat> we had another whistleblower, I know hasn't been talked about too much publicly. He, he's talking about a program that was set up by Clapper and Brennan inside CIA, so nobody in the government would know it was running. And that was to spy on anybody they wanted to in the country. Uh, and uh, that clearly uh, was, in my view, uh, the way uh, the, the, the people who were involved in setting up Goose for Two most likely came from that group. And the reason I say that is because of the Russian fingerprints that were uh, discovered by Tim and group over there in the UK that uh, were in some of the emails that uh, Goose for Two put out on the 15th of June that were published by WikiLeaks later as a part of the Podesta batch that did not have this fingerprints. Now that told me very clearly that's just more ammunition saying it's this group inside CIA because that's the kind of thing that you would expect from a marble framework type program that was compromised in Vault 7. And in Vault 7, they also said that that program was used once in 2016. So I think we're looking at that time it was used. So to me, it all, it all points back at CIA as the origin of Goose for Two. I'm reminded of the uh, when did you stop beating your wife uh, question that Adam Schiff uh, asked Sean Henry. Again, Sean Henry, the chief of CrowdStrike, this uh, cyber firm of dubious repute that the DNC hired and paid for just as they hired and paid for uh, Christopher Steele. So uh, what uh, Adam Schiff says is, uh, so Mr. Henry, can you tell us when uh, the Russians hacked uh, those emails. And <laughs> Henry <clears throat> has, to, has to consult his counsel. <laughs> you think he would notice, right? So he said, oh, well, it's my counsel says, uh, we don't know that they were exfiltrated, much less when they were exfiltrated. Sometimes we have really good evidence that they've been exfiltrated, but we, we don't have any evidence that they've been exfiltrated. So, so there you go, you know, here's Sean Henry admitting that. Now, this to us is pretty conclusive proof that if the FBI relied on CrowdStrike, which they say they did, uh, saying it was a top flight organization, which it wasn't, uh, then, you know, the whole, the whole foundation of Russian hacking and, and, and the uh, mm. gate fall apart. And so this is really a serious thing. I'll just add this, that uh, although we, we made a big thing out of the, uh, uh, the transfer rate, uh, indicating that it wasn't a hack, but rather it was a download onto a thumb drive, uh, it, well before that, I remember Bill saying in December of 2016, okay, if it were a hack, ipso facto, NSA would have that data. And on the off chance they didn't have it, one of our friendly collection allies would, would have it, okay? That's 99% that's uh, true, okay? No one would 
Well, the Baltimore Sun did publish a couple of our op-eds. So that was December of 16. Then we published this memo on the transfer rate mostly uh, in July of 17. Yep. And <clears throat> this uh, indication that the data was indeed saved uh, in a format that had nothing to do with the incident, but had lots to do with a thumb drive. That's called the FAT format. And before I forget what the FAT stands for, Bill, would you take that one and explain? That's a file allocation <laughs> format. Right. And uh, wow. what it means simply is when a, uh, this program downloads and indexes data on the thumb drive or a storage device, it modifies the last the modified time on each file to the nearest even second. That's all. And so all 35,813 emails from published by WikiLeaks from the DNC have their last modified times rounded off to an even second. And to specify for a moment, in 2017 in July, the VIPS memo that you all published was specifically in reference to the NGP van files published by Goose for Two. Whereas I know that Bill, yourself, and some others have also studied the DNC emails, and that's yeah. where we get this discussion of fat yeah. as well. Yeah. So just so the, the viewers understand. But I wanted to go back to this concept of the Podesta email attachment that was the Trump opposition report being the document that not only had the Russian fingerprints that Tim's article has discussed and that his analysis has focused on for a very long time, but also was referenced by CrowdStrike in June when it first announced in the Washington Post that, you know, the DNC has been hacked, this Trump opposition document has been stolen from the DNC. Well, like, as you said, we've come to find out that that's a Podesta attachment. Can you <clears throat> comment on the significance of that? Well, I see near as I can tell from the last modified times, just looking at those of the Podesta emails, those are mixed, odd, and even. So that would uh, that would not necessarily uh, indicate it was downloaded locally, but that it was hacked. So yeah, I don't have any problem with that statement yeah, that it was hacked. Ray, do you have any comment on that? Uh, not really. Um, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Another thing that Tim's uh, analysis has always focused on is the kind of agenda. And obviously his article recently is about the agenda of Gooseper 2 and Gooseper 2's interaction with WikiLeaks. We know that uh, in a private DM conversation with an actress named Robin Young, Gooseper 2's persona had basically suggested that Seth Rich was his source. And then meanwhile, in other conversations, you know, Gooseper 2 is presenting themselves as the source for WikiLeaks. You know, do you have any thoughts on kind of the angle that this persona seems to have had and which Tim is discussing in this latest piece that he's published? It's really difficult to parse each and every comment uh, in that exchange. Uh, but the question, of course, is uh, Kui Bono, who profits from the notion that the Russians hack? And that, that answer is easy. It's the whole uh, group that <clears throat> can try, starting with Hillary Clinton herself, as a way to disguise or to distract attention from what was in those emails. What was in those emails, one will remember, is uh, proof that Hillary and the DNC stole the nomination from uh, Bernie Sanders, <laughs> as they did again this year. Uh, so, you know, there was a real major effort to distract attention from that. It was mm. a magnificent distraction, if you will. Mm. And Say, why do the Russians do? The Russians are Russian, Russian, and nobody asked, well, what's in those emails? And those emails were very damning. So did those emails uh, hurt Hillary Clinton? Well, I would say for the 0.12% of the American people who are aware of them, well, probably yes. Was that enough to, to skew the election? <laughs> I don't think so. So uh, this is really important. In other words, it fulfilled several functions to disguise uh, the fact Emails said what they did uh, to give post-election Hillary and her folks uh, some some excuse to have lost. Okay, and then probably most important to put the spike on any effort that uh, Donald Trump had, if he was serious, to improve relations with Russia. I mean, you improve relations with Russia. What happens to the Mickey Mat? What happens to the profiteering uh, on all, all the weaponry? Mickey Matt, by the way, is the military and <laughs> congressional intelligence media academia think tank complex. Why do I say media? Because media is the cornerstone, all this stuff. And without the media drumming this drum for three years now, 
uh, most Americans would be open to the suggestion that, whoa, maybe the Russians didn't hack. Right now, <laughs> there's no, right now it's a real uphill struggle. So coming away from this goose for two story, what do you all make of the fact that the media seems to, you know, in the wake of uh, your uh, various memos, in the wake of Tim's analysis and analysis by other analysts in the field, the, the media seems to have at times almost seemed to walk away from the goose for two narrative and kind of switch it out with other aspects of the Russiagate, um, you know, saga. What do you feel that the media's kind of status is right now? Have they just kind of decided to forget Goose for Two and walk away from it? Or do you think that they're still going to be trying to push this narrative in the history books that the DNC was hacked and that Goose for Two was WikiLeaks's source? Well, uh, if I can answer that one first, because I was the one who was called a conspiracy theorist by the entire mainstream media. <laughs> I think they have a very large crow to eat. You know, because they've been uh, fabricating this story and they've known it's been a falsehood from the beginning. They did, they've done no basic research on it like the uh, uh, in, investigative reporters are supposed to do. They do not fulfill their obligation under the First Amendment of the Constitution. So my, I vote to exclude them. You know, they're no longer a part of that. They're part, a tool of the CIA and the intelligence community and the government. So they no longer serve the people of the United States. So uh, my view is they should be taken out of the First Amendment. <laughs> I could add a little something here. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of crow to go around. But uh, how many people know about all this? I mean, let's, on the 7th of May, what's today, the 23rd or 24th? On the 7th of May, uh, the uh, House Intelligence Committee released this testimony. Now, thanks to, to real investigators like Aaron Matei and a couple of the rest of us, we were alerted to it right away because Aaron took the trouble to read the testimony of CrowdStrike's head, um, Sean Henry. And what does it say? It says that, well, uh, hold on, American people. Under oath, I have to admit that there's no evidence that the Russians or anybody else hacked the DNC. Whoa, okay, what, what am I saying here? Well, I don't know. The traction would say 23 minus seven is what six so it's more than two weeks that before since that happened has the new york times said anything about it no washington post no wall street journal i don't think so la time no so the infinite capacity of the mainstream media which is the cornerstone of mickey matt to not only obfuscate but completely ignore critical information like this is is really quite striking. I've never seen the like of it. So just as with the Mueller report, where they all proved uh, <laughs> either terribly naive or purposefully uh, uh, distracting, mm -hmm. uh, now they can just uh, either, you know, will somebody bring this to their attention? Well, we've been trying like hell, uh, but we can't get any air or any print uh, in any of the so-called mainstream media, that's why it's so good for us to have a chance to vent, as I am doing right now, uh, in a forum like this. Great, did MSNBC report the Henry remarks? I'm sorry? Did MSNBC report the Henry remarks? Uh, I, not that I'm aware of, but I, I have to- <laughs> Yes? I'm allergic to MSNBC. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just wanna hear you say no again. It was so comforting. Yeah. But I wanna go back to the, you mentioned Henry's testimony that wasn't reported. And he was asked about the date. When was this uh, hack supposedly took place? And that's when he said, well, we, there was no hack. But then um, Sh um, Schiff, Adam Schiff, the chairman of that committee, supplied a date. I, I can't remember exactly, it was April 26th, I think. It was in April. And so, oh, yeah, yeah, I think I remember that. Now, that's the date that's in the Mueller uh, indictment and report that this hack supposedly took place. So my question to you and Bill is, based on what you might know, what do you think Mueller was basing this, his basically his indictment and dates like that mm. on? Was that NSA material that who could get a hack? Was it the FBI? Who do you think was the basis of this? Bill, shaking your head, you go first. Okay, uh, I'll volunteer, yeah. And I, uh, in the Rosenstein indictment, he goes through uh, this good for two guy did this, this did that, and this did that. And people have alleged they thought that was NSA data or came from NSA. And I, I quite clearly could say, uh, no, it didn't. And the reason is pretty simple. 
anything that the NSA collects is classified. And so therefore, what Rosenstein would be doing would be exposing classified material to the public. And he should have been redacted if that was the case. That's the standard procedure. If you in, uh, expose the classified material, you, re you redact that part. So it also uh, in, implied methods and act sources and methods like how we, how we got it, where we got it from, and things of that nature. So all that should have been redacted if it came from NSA or FBI. Well, wait a minute. It did wait, not. Wait a minute. Rod I, assume it came, I assume it came from a third party like CrowdStrike or some other company. And okay. they made it up. And so therefore, it's, it's basically uh, inadmissible as hearsay. Well, first of all, Rod Rosenstein was the acting attorney general at the time, correct? Yep. Right. And Rosenstein, you're saying that he, why couldn't the NSA show this to Mueller's team or to Rosenstein and say, you can't say where it came from, you can't give anything away, but this is the facts. And then you just have to make that uh, Yeah, but he can't assertion. publish it in an indictment without redacting it. But what the indictment did not say the source of that information, correct? It's on the web. Yeah, it didn't, but it said here, this goose for two did, went in here and right. did this and that and so on. That would have to be uh, classified if it came from NSA. Right, but I'm saying, how do we not know that the NSA didn't give that to Rosenstein and said you can't mention your source? Well, it's in violation of the uh, Title 18 law. You know, it, <clears throat> it's, a, it's a criminal violation of, a, of leaking classified material. Even so to the attorney general? Even to that's what Rosenstein is guilty of. Even to the attorney general? Exactly. Uh, the only one who can, who can declassify is the president. What about parallel construction here? You've talked often about that, allowing the DOJ to and then you go yeah. ahead and build their own case. That's not what happened here, though, is it? They didn't build no, the case. No, it's not a parallel construction. Yeah, that's the point. Now, Bill, uh, Ray said they knew they were lying right from the beginning. Yeah. You went to see Mr. Pompeo when he was the head of the Central Intelligence Agency on the word of the president of the United States, correct? Yep. That's correct. Which means he's looking at the memo, which is quite interesting. Your memos. Now, Pompe you gave Pompeo a chance there to back out of this, which is becoming an embarrassment. How did he respond to you? Well, you know, I told him that his agency and all the other IC agencies were lying to him and the president. Because, you know, they weren't telling him the truth about this. These people know what's going on. Uh, <clears throat> and he, say, he said he found it hard to believe that these... Uh, that the people in his agency or other agencies would be doing that. Well, I mean, it's becoming very clear to everybody that, that in fact has been the case and has been the case for a very long time, especially in dealing with this Russiagate thing, not, not counting the weapons of mass destructions or the Tonkin Gulf affair or any things that have gotten us into wars that were based on lies. So, I mean, you know, he's the, the, he knows it. I think the president knows it better than he does, but he is basically uh, a bureaucrat backing away from it. Did he say he couldn't understand the technical aspects of it? Uh, no, in fact, he had two other people who I assume were uh, at least representatives of the technical groups that were involved at CIA. He had them there and they asked me, uh, how did we do the calculations? And I told them and, uh, you know, that was it. Well, uh, Pompeo has moved on to war mongering against China. Now he seems to have forgotten Russia altogether. Yeah. I want to yeah. ask Ray and Bill one question that's always troubled me when I thought about who Gustavo II Borno might actually be. If he was not the Russians, who would benefit, as Ray said, mm. Qui Bono would be Clinton campaign, uh, people in the intelligence community who wanted Clinton to win, who thought that she was going to win. And then I thought, well, why would they then send these emails to WikiLeaks, Hillary Clinton emails that are damaging, clearly damaging, whether or not they influenced or how much they influenced the election, we can put aside. But why would they send them? And then in Tim's article, as I was going through it, preparing it for publication, I saw something I'd never seen before, and that is a direct message from WikiLeaks to someone uh, saying, uh, we did not use anything that Guccifer sent us. And I thought about that. If that's a true statement, it, and in fact, if Guccifer sent stuff as uh, this gig amount of file, as the Mueller report says, that Guccifer sent to WikiLeaks, could it be that, in fact, the NSA knew, somebody in government knew, that WikiLeaks already had all these emails, and that they were made to be sent again by Guccifer in order to create 
uh, a person who they can pin on the Russians because they already knew WikiLeaks had this and was going to publish it. So the horse had bolted and uh, now there was a matter <laughs> of blaming the Russians for it. Is that possible, Bill? Is that what you think may have happened? No, I think that's, that's exactly what you're, you hit it right on the head there, uh, Joe. I think that's exactly what, what happened and the motivation for uh, them doing it. So, you know, it just it added nothing to WikiLeaks. <laughs> and so there was no damage done by it uh, from the Clinton side. So, you know, I think that that's just, uh, and they knew, by the way, that uh, the Podesta emails were, were hacked, but not the DNC. So they, that didn't cost them anything. Do they know who hacked the uh, Podesta emails? Do they, they really should. know? They should, because every packet hacked carries with it, uh, you know, internal addressing to get it from point A to point B in the world. And they're I mean, saying, yeah. they're saying, they're saying now through Mueller's <laughs> indictment that it was also the GRU that hacked well, Podesta. Produce, produce the, uh, they should produce the uh, IPs and all of that from the, uh, and all the uh, TCP IP format going with those, uh, those uh, or whatever format it used that, uh, that were uh, being used to, to exfiltrate that data. I mean, NSA, NSA covers all of the X. You know, there are only certain transoceanic cables that surface on the U.S. And those carry all transmissions from foreigners to U.S. and U.S. to foreigners or foreigners to foreigners through the U.S. So that means if you wanted to get anything that was foreign, tap those points and those points only and you'll get it. But NSA is tapping the entire United States and I've got all the tap points for them, a little over 100 and some tap points that they use inside the 48 states of the United States. So there's no question about them having the data. They should actually have it. If not them, then the British who tap the oceanic cables or the satellites or any other way to get data across the Atlantic and, uh, and uh, other countries that are participating with them in Europe. Somewhere along the line, they've got those packets. So who did it and wh who were the IPs and where did it come from? And where did it go and when? They know all of that. But you said that's classified. They wouldn't be able to tell us or even the Attorney General. The president can declassify it anytime he wants. Yeah. Ray, you're shaking your head. Go on. The forensics are not classified. Uh, in other words, uh, you know, you can release this kind of information. I would like to uh, go back and just make clear for our watchers, our listeners. Um, it was on June 12th, uh, 2016, that Julian Assange publicly announced, quote, we have emails mm -hmm. released. Hillary Clinton pending publication period end quote that's when everybody knew uh oh the DNC was really in trouble because those <laughs> emails almost certainly show how Hillary stole the nomination from Bernie Sanders as this has happened more recently as well now that's when it started so everyone knew that those emails were going to be published pending publication in the event they were published three days before the Democratic National Convention on 22nd of July, 2016. Now, this gave uh, all kinds of nefarious people, what, six weeks or so, I forget, the, you know, do the subtraction to figure out how to, how to explain this terrible revelation of how Hillary and the DC stole the nomination. And so that's mm. when this first two was, mm was created uh, like a phoenix. Uh, that's why CrowdStrike came right in and said, ah, it's got Russian fingerprints or footprints on it. And then the, the next day, Gustavo Tua says, yep, it sure does. And <clears throat> me, I'm working for the Russians. I mean, hello, how transparent is all that? So what I'm saying is that's the background. But even before that, Bill and I worked on this back in November, December of 2016. And Bill told me, and he said, look, there's a difference between a hack and a leak. And a leak it can be done on the thumb drive, and there's no evidence of a hack. Now, that was December 2016. We had it published in the Baltimore Sun. Fast forward, December 2017, Sean Henry says, yeah, Bill Binney was right. Uh, there was no evidence of <laughs> no. No, he didn't say Bill Binney was right, but he said there's no evidence of a hack. So there's a year later. So all this time we've been saying, look, if there were the kinds of information, NSA would have it, and there'd be no detriment in its releasing it. So 
Why was that not sufficient? Well, that was not sufficient because of Rumsfeld's dictum. Okay, you remember what he said? The absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Went to Princeton to learn that. Okay, now, what does it mean? Well, just because we have no evidence of weapons of mass destruction doesn't mean they're not there. So transform that to just because we have no evidence of a Russian hack doesn't mean they didn't hack. Okay, well, <laughs> okay, that's what it, that's where it stood at the at the December January 2016 2017 until we did our memo in July of 2017 based thank goodness on uh, Tim Leonard's good work, uh, the good work of Forensicator, uh, the good work of Skip Folden who ran uh, ran <laughs> site at IT for IBM for many years. Uh, we, we had these outside people that were, were just really uh, as, uh, as full of integrity as you could imagine. And we, with their help, we published and we told the president, look, Mr. President, it wasn't a, a hack of anybody by Russia or by anybody else. It was a leak. We can prove it. And by the way, Mr. President, you ought to ask around, find out who Guccifer 2.0 is. <laughs> now, he did. Uh, uh, then CIA director Pompeo, hey, you ought to have Vinny in. And the first thing he says to Vinny, if, uh, if I have this quote right, Bill, was, uh, th you should appreciate the only reason I invited you here, Mr. Vinny, is because the president told me to. He said, uh, if I want to know about uh, Russian hacking, I need to talk to you. <laughs> is that right, Bill? Is that what he said? Yeah, if you wanted to know facts about Russiagate, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, you have to talk to me. Yeah, that's exactly he, right. And you told him uh, he, his people were lying to him, right? That's right. And he said, I'm going to get at that. No, he didn't say that, did he? He's afraid of his own people. He's afraid of his own people because he knows his own people played a role in this. Yep. There's a whole conflict that John Brennan set up for the cyber warfare. You might, you might say a word about that because you were there, Bill, when that, when that kind of close cooperation between CIA and NSA had its inception. Yeah, it started basically, it got much closer after 9-11 because they, you know, they were all the blame game, you know, who, who didn't do what and who should have done what, you know, and all of that. But uh, yeah, that's when they started really cooperating. But uh, the hundreds of millions of lines of, of Vault 7 code that we talked about when it came out was uh, basically a compilation of data, uh, attacks, different attacks on firewalls, operating systems, uh, servers, switches, so on collected from uh, NSA and GCHQ also shared with CIA. So, you know, it's all a collective effort because CIA didn't come up with all that, all that effort over, over, I think a two year period that they had their cyber attack program running inside CIA, something like that. They could never have come up with all that uh, expertise in that short period of time. So it had to be a transfer of data from NSA and GCHQ to them, so. Well, Vault 7's uh, 700 million lines of code sounds like a lot. Uh, to a history major, uh, can you translate that into dollars? <laughs> yeah, at the time, this is back when I was in there in 2001, uh, source code was, they charged $25 a line of source code. So $25 per line, you know, it's a few billion dollars worth of code. That's a lot, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <clears throat> well, uh, Marble Framework, which is the obfuscation tool uh, where they can take Russian, Chinese, Arabic, uh, Persian, and uh, the Korean and lead little telltale signs here and there. Uh, that was just part of Vault 7, but still right. probably up two or three million lines of code, right? Well, a few hundred thousand anyway, yeah. <laughs> We don't know yet whether it's ever been used, do we? But um, yeah, it was. Yeah, it was once, right? Yeah, in that 2016. Was a... <laughs> well, that's what you're saying. No, no, no. that was in Vault Seven. This came with uh, with the, the the announcement, with the WikiLeaks announcement, uh, the the memo that they released that they got from the CIA insider said it had been used in 2016. So that's verified. Where? In Iran. Oh, with oh, I think we're looking at it with the, uh, with the. Uh, yeah, I understand that, but they <laughs> never the spelled it. I got that, but I don't think they're spelling that out, do they? In that memo, yeah. that it just said it was in 2016. It did say it was used, and that's yep. all it said. 
Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> I wonder what happened in 2016. I have no idea. Uh, was there an election or something? Anyway, <laughs> I want to point out that uh, Sean <clears throat> Henry, when he testified, <clears throat> he was under oath and it was behind closed doors and he thought it would never get out. So when you're in that situation, you're going to probably tell the truth because you don't want to commit perjury and you don't think anybody's going to find out about it anyway, right? And we did yeah. find out about it. So that's really <laughs> interesting. Do you think that uh, John Durham now is, of course, has been appointed by uh, the Attorney General to look into the origins of Russiagate, what we're talking about tonight? Now, we really don't know the whole scope of Durham's investigation, but do you have any uh, idea or do you think he might be even looking into this Guccifer question? that who this was and who may have been behind these hacks or leaks rather? Big question, well, we so. don't know, you do. I do, yeah, yeah because uh, you know, I mean, it's gotta get there. I mean, it's got to be a part of it because it was a part of uh, the it's Russian the origin. allegation. Yeah, I mean- That is the origin, the hack yeah. really, or well, the leak uh, was uh, the origin, which Obama couldn't figure out whether it was a hack or a leak either in his statement. He, in the same sentence, he used both hack and leak just to cover himself, I guess. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Whichever it was. So you, he probably would look at this. Now, uh, Obama, as, as Ray has pointed out in numerous of his, of his pieces, Trump has shown a propensity to get very scared when he's uh, faced with having to reveal something that will anger the intelligence services. Uh, for example, the Kennedy assassination thing. But this involves him personally. And that couldn't be different because this really damaged him. Uh, and it's, he's going into another election. So he wants to use the turn the tables, obviously, if he could use this against the people who try to hurt him. So uh, <clears throat> Bill, Bill, first, what do, you, do you think that uh, Trump <laughs> will make something out of this if, in fact, there are findings by Durham before the election, presumably? And do you think Brennan, you say Brennan, earlier we were chatting before we went on the air, that uh, Brennan had not been uh, questioned yet by Durham. Can you also talk about that? Well, yeah. I, I, well, I mean, I think they're saving Brennan for the last because they're accumulating more and more evidence every time they investigate things. Like, for example, they investigating the hammer, which I think is going on right now. Uh, <clears throat> in which case, that's the program set up by Clapper and, and Brennan. According to the whistleblower, that's what he's alleging. These two guys set up this program internally in CIA so that they could spy on anybody they wanted without being known that that was happening. See, for example, if you go, uh, like all the unmasking that's being done now, I actually had recommended that they go back and look at the last five years worth of unmasking of people, of US citizens inside the country in, in NSA reporting. And who did that? And that could help him direct the questioning and also, uh, you know, direct him to ask what kind of questions he should ask. So uh, <clears throat> hopefully that's, that's what's happening and that uh, that's one aspect of it. But the other is the anytime anyone goes into the NSA database, he, you know, through the IC REACH program, CIA can do that without asking anything. But they do get recorded when they do it. So that they're in the, in the network log, there's a record of them coming in and interrogating the NSA database. What they got, where they went, what they took, what they exfiltrated out. So all of that is on the record inside NSA. So if they want to avoid being on the record inside the government, that no one in the government could find out what they were doing, they set up their own program internally in CIA in parallel, tapping into the same access points that NSA has, which they already know exist and pulling that data off in parallel with NSA. So that's how they, that's how they uh, get the information uh, in this, in the, uh, from the existing system without doing anything, and in addition to make it look like they're actively coming into the system to do something, you know? Because you revealing already exists and they can simply tap in. Are you revealing any classified information right now, Bill, and what you're saying? Well, it's classified uh, by them, but it's on the web. <laughs> so it's because, on the because public. Then and I, oh. and I informed uh, 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 Herr Clapper when he was the DNI that I did not give up my First Amendment right to talk about anything in the public domain for anybody, Mr. Clapper. Because, because you're, you're giving classified material to unauthorized persons like me, Elizabeth, even Ray now, and all the people watching, and Julian Assange is in jail for that very thing. So I just wanted to be careful here. But um, <clears throat> now listen, or listen. Full speed ahead there, Joe. Listen, the people um, need to know yeah. this is occurring. It's a direct 
I will point out to Joe, Executive Order 13526, Section 1.7, which governs all classification of material inside the United States government. You cannot classify anything that's evidence of a crime. Spying on US citizens without a warrant is a crime. And that's what I'm exposing. You do carry that around in your pocket like some people do the, Const the Constitution, I'm, that executive order? Yeah, I'm order. waiting to get into the federal courts. I put an affidavit into Roger Stone's case and General Flynn's case trying to get into court to say this kind of stuff, you know? And you know, they won't let me in. The judges will not let me testify. I wonder why. Now, when you talk about that executive order, I often think that the collateral murder video that Chelsea Manning found on a shelf and then it released it, crime. that was not classified. And I wonder if it wasn't classified because it was a war crime, so they couldn't classify it. Right. You think that's right? That's right. Okay, now I'm going to get to Ray now. Ray, unless you have something to say, because you have repeatedly written in the august pages of Consortium News and have said in various venues <laughs> that you believe James Comey, former FBI director, James Clapper, former DNI, and John Brennan, former CIA director, could be indicted for crimes. What crimes, <laughs> what statutes would they have broken in this story? Yes, Bill has it written down. He's got that in the other pocket. He's got the uh, executive order in the right pocket and the crimes yes. in the other. So, Bill, you want to answer that first? Sure. Let me start out with simply violations of the First, Fourth, Fifth, and Sixth Amendments of the Constitution. Uh, perjury uh, with the parallel construction, falsely uh, uh, falsifying evidence in a court, obstruction of justice, hiding all this activity under a classification that they try to keep out of the public now. And then Brady violations of hiding any exculpatory evidence from not only um, uh, General Flynn's case, but all the other thousands of cases they've tried in court falsifying evidence. And conspiracy to frame General Flynn and others, including us, you know, the NSA whistleblowers, and sedition, uh, subverting the constitutional form of government that we've got, and then treason, the disloyalty to kill a sovereign or overthrow the government. This is trying to overthrow the government. We actually went through an attempted coup. And then just outright illegal leaks. So, I mean, that's simply my list, and I'm not a lawyer. Ah, but they, did, but they didn't lie to an FBI agent. So uh, that's, all oh, yeah. you, that, that's all you got, Bill? Ray, yeah. you, uh... <laughs> well, glad, I'm glad that you were prepared to answer that question, Bill, because uh, I could also answer it. Um, and I'd add the FISA violations. FISA? And, taking this garbage from uh, Christopher Steele, uh, making it into the justification for at least three of those four vice appeals. I mean, the abuse of, of, of the judicial proceeding, and maybe I'll just say this, that uh, people say to me, now, Ray, come on, give me a break. Uh, you're saying that the top intelligence and the top law enforcement officials of our country uh, were playing willy-nilly with the law and the Constitution at the end of 2016, early 17? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Oh, come Call on. the conspiracy. And I say, well, how could that be? And yeah. I say, well, um, don't you remember? I mean, it's only four years ago. Don't you remember that Hillary bound to win? Everyone expected Hillary to be a shoe-in. James Comey in his book writes, quote, I was operating in an environment in which Hillary Clinton was bound to win, period, end quote. Well, hello, you're, you're operating in that environment. You're going to take liberties with the law, the Constitution, <clears throat> if you have a conscience, and you're going to do what you can to ingratiate yourself with Hillary so that when she, she wins, inevitably, <laughs> you get promoted, you get, you, you, you're allowed to stay in your job. Hello, it's going to be great. The only problem was she, she didn't win, okay? Now, comes the real problem for them. We were so sure she's going to win, we didn't take the rudimentary steps to hide our tracks. It's all over our computers and our hard copy of what we did. My God, what would you do now? <laughs> well, that's part of the motivation for Russiagate. You distract everything. You, you vilify Trump, and you make sure that it's never uncovered, except there was so much stuff, so much stuff that Durham now <clears throat> had, that it's coming down to the denouement. So, you know, it's pretty easy to explain. If you remember, Hillary's going to win. These guys took all kinds of liberties with the Constitution and the law. Now, Bill and I feel sort of, you know, we both took a solemn oath uh, to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, 
foreign and domestic. And we spent our careers defending against foreign enemies in, in a pretty sophisticated intelligence environment. We never expected, and Billy can speak for himself, but I never expected uh, to be trying to defend the Constitution of the United States from enemies domestic, but that's what we're doing. I checked yeah. with law. Does our oath ha have any expiration date? <laughs> no, it doesn't. Okay. Well, uh, aren't you tired doing this? We get asked. And I say, well, you know, I didn't take the solemn oath to, to defend and protect the Constitution of the United States uh, from all enemies, foreign and domestic, until I got tired. Now, Bill and I are of an age where we could easily get tired, but we ain't there yet, and we're going to keep pursuing this. And I'm just delighted that we have a chance to air all this stuff in a forum that might get other people to spread the truth around. And, Ray, we've got our grandchildren and others' grandchildren to do this for. Yep. That's exactly right. Well, uh, Bill, you mentioned Flynn. I'd like to move on to there, unless Elizabeth has a few more questions on Guccifer. Yes, I just have one more aside, really, and that is to return to the fact that one of the really key points that Tim's latest piece discusses is the fact that Guccifer, too, suggested at, at one time that Assange was connected to the Russians. And I think that that definitely, as uh, Tim points out, that begs the question, if it was, if Guccifer, too, was this Russian hacking operation, why on earth would they suggest that Assange was connected to Russians? And obviously that just is absurd. And now that, that also does seem to tie into this thing where we see the context in which Goose for Two claimed Seth Rich was their source. They right around the time that Assange was going on television, on Dutch TV and indirectly discussing Seth Rich's death. It's just important to visit that so that our viewers are aware that this isn't simply one angle that this Goose for Two persona sort of um, went forward with. It seemed to kind of morph and change based on whatever the news cycle was doing. And as Tim points out, the consistent thread is that it portrays WikiLeaks and Assange as in a very bad light. I didn't know if you have any other uh, thoughts on that, Bill and Ray. It's well, yeah, another way of, uh, of, uh, of playing what I call the Wizard of Oz game. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Look over there. And it's just another look over there. That's all. We're just trying to keep the public uh, looking in different places. You, you get rid of that one, get another one, you know, and so on. So it just keeps, uh, don't look at the man behind the curtain, you know? So that's the whole idea. I, I agree, Bill. And uh, thanks for posing this, uh, Elizabeth. You know, what's really important here is the obvious question. If, as the head of CrowdStrike has now testified under oath, there was no Russian hack or no hack of the DNC emails by anybody, okay? Well, how did they get to WikiLeaks? Now, uh, no one less than the President of the United States, his name was Obama, two days before he left office said, you know, the conclusions of the intelligence community with respect to how the emails got to <coughs> WikiLeaks are inconclusive <coughs> as well. He talked hack, he talked, uh, he talked leak. So he wanted to put, go on record saying, I don't know how they got to WikiLeaks. So how did they get to WikiLeaks? <laughs> Who put that thumb drive <laughs> in the uh, DNC computer? Well, Elizabeth, you mentioned Seth Rich. And now we know that the FBI did investigate <laughs> Seth Rich, that they did look into his computer. We have testimony to that effect. And they lied. And the FBI, no, no, please, people, don't, don't, don't uh, pale before this accusation. The FBI lied in saying they had no records at all, Seth Rich. And another FOIA comes in and says, uh, we want this, this exchange of emails. And all of a sudden, there are lots of things the FBI has but with the subject line, Seth Rich. Not buried in the text, but so, so the FBI lied about having, uh, about having <clears throat> and they did investigate. <laughs> There's the th focus, and there are some lawsuits going on now where, yep. again, it's all predicted, the truth is going to come out because it will <clears> be <throat> testimony. These people are going to be, you know, what about all this? And uh, the NSA has chapter and verse on all this. You can be sure of that, as Bill has explained. And they're going to either be, be subpoenaed into telling the truth, or it's going to be more obfuscation uh, I'm not sure which is going to be the end result. Can, can I add one thing here about this uh, whole thing? What it really is, is uh, 
a threat to any free investigative reporting by anybody. And if you look at it, what they're doing to uh, Julian Assange is to silence the truth. And, uh, and what they're doing with the mainstream media, since the mainstream media basically is an arm of CIA and the intelligence community and the government, they're taking yeah. over all of, the, all of the information flow to the public. Now, this is one of the fundamental things that totalitarian states do right from the beginning is to censor and control information to the public. And so that's what they're doing. And this is the basic threat. And it's in action right now. We're down this slope to a totalitarian state. And this is one of the main steps they have to take. People need to start to realize that, that that's what's going on here. And Congress is cowardly. Yep. And even the judiciary is involved now. Witness the fact that, uh, well, for a while last year, I had subpoena envy, you know subpoena envy because all my friends like Bill were getting subpoenas right and left. And <laughs> finally I got one in December and then I got another one in February. So Bill, you want to say a word about the intrusive nature of these subpoenas? Well, they wanted, they wanted uh, uh, anything that in any, would any way would touch on the, on their case, right? In any way. And they gave us certain terms and things that those. So I just did a general search for the terms, you know, and I just, got a whole bunch of stuff. I mean, I got more, more stuff than I care about. I thought, well, okay, I'll just dump it all on them. So I just gave them all, everything I had, I just gave them, you know? And, uh, you know, they, they, I think they're choking, but I also gave them all of the evidence, including the goose or two photographs of the calculations of all the speeds and everything, item by item, timeline by timeline, and also all of the last modified times of all of the DNC emails and all of the Podesta emails so that they had all that basic evidence. And I haven't heard from them since, and I've not been allowed to report, to, to testify in any court, okay? So what's yep. that tell you? The judges are involved in a scam too. So we uh, need to get rid of them also. You gave them a lot more than they really wanted to have, Bill, right? Yes, I, I don't know, you know. They had two questions. One was, all information not already published about what you VIPS have said about a Russian hack and a Russian leak, okay? And then the next one was very, very much like it. It was just a, a elaboration of that. They wanted every, all our correspondence in preparing these memos and, uh, and, and com coming up with our issuances. And they wanted to know, I guess they were looking, as I reconstructed Bill, I think they were looking for that email that my old friend uh, Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin sent me uh, which said, way to go, Ray, you and Benny are doing a great job obfuscating what I did and hacking into the DNC. Is that what they were looking for? Oh my God. Well, there ain't no such thing, of course. It wouldn't surprise me if they, if they forced something like that. But as of now, uh, yeah, it's, just been a, it's just been an incredible witness of how intrusive these, uh, yeah. these officials can be and asking you to drain your computer of just about everything that mentions certain keywords. So that's I, I, I didn't have a problem, Ray, because the, in my emails, I, I was basically saying what I thought about the U.S. government, all the crimes they were committing, everything. So I was quite prepared to go into court at any time and testify to that. So but that guy, I've never been asked, even though I've submitted affidavits, sworn affidavits into the courts, you know, uh, I, well, still have a, I still have the Third Circuit Court of Appeals uh, considering the unconstitutional uh, lawsuit that, that I and another fellow have against the U.S. government, that's still going in the appeals court. And we're now writing an appeal to the Supreme Court. So hopefully now, we get into that. I just wanted to but clarify, uh, the subpoenas that you got, Bill, were in the Roger Stone case? Is that correct? Uh, in the Seth Rich case. Oh, also in the Seth Rich case. But you were subpoenaed yes. in Roger mostly, Stone, too, weren't Mostly oh. Seth Rich. Seth I put Rich. in affidavits to Roger Stone's <clears throat> case. Okay, yeah. the Seth Rich case was the lawsuit by Aaron Rich, that's brother against uh, Ed Botovsky. Yeah, for right. And somehow nice implicated. Person, uh, and, and somebody else, I can't remember who it was, I'll have to look and see. Okay. But, uh, All right, so it's like the same case. Yeah. Well, as, as a reporter, I have subpoena envy too. That I can't use yeah. that. We could never use yeah. subpoenas. That's the one thing government yeah. investigators have that reporters don't have. I'd like to move on to General Michael Flynn. Because uh, as uh, I said at the opening, we, there has been some very interesting revelations recently. The testimonies, not only of Henry, but there were numerous people, and it's taking a lot of time to read through all that. 
may be able to do another show because uh, Clapper testified, a whole bunch of people testified in that House Intelligence Committee uh, hearing behind closed doors. Now the Michael Flynn case, the FBI released on April 30th, I believe around that time, some quite interesting memos. And it appears to show that the Washington field office decided that they had no case against Flynn having colluded in some way with the Russians or did anything illegal. They didn't even entertain this ridiculous Logan Act, which is never, no one's ever been prosecuted for. It has to do with the private citizen doing foreign policy with another state. And of course, he was the incoming national security advisor. So the FBI tried to shut this down and somehow miraculously, it was resurrected. And the, the memo seemed to show that Peter Strzok, who's in the center of all of this, including the Hillary Clinton uh, emails, uh, not the WikiLeaks related <laughs> emails, but the ones on her servers, he, he was involved in that too. And he's involved in Flynn. And he's been involved, he was on the Mueller investigative team until he got outed because of his text and how to be fired. So he seems to be saying uh, now in a memo that the seventh floor of the FBI wanted it reopened even though the field office said to close it. Now, I don't know how the, that Washington office memo says close it if the people on the seventh floor weren't behind that. So I don't know what Strzok is talking about. So I want to ask you guys, who's on the seventh floor beside Comey? Is McCabe, the deputy, uh, does he happen to be there, by the way? Well, the seventh floor in Washington traditionally uh, talks about the director of the FBI, the director of the CIA, director of the NSA, or maybe NSA has eight floors. Do they have eight, eight floors? Eight floor, it's an eight floor in NSA. <laughs> so, <okay>. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but what's important, Joe, is that the, uh, the investigation was supposed to be closed. This guy did his work. He looked at, from the Washington field office. He said, hey, there's nothing here on Flynn. Close the investigation. Now, <laughs> <laughs> The FBI apparently isn't very efficient because that something got uh, lost in, 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 in the shuffle within somebody's inbox. And for a day or two, they didn't close it. And then you have Schiff saying, is that closed yet? And uh, I think it was his paramour says, no, no, because it was a screw up, but a, but a godsend, a godsend screw up. They didn't close it. So now seventh floor wants to not reopen it, just continue it. And they went ahead and, and uh, yeah, they framed them. You know, I, I know Flynn, and I know a son, and, and I know a human aspect of being a father and a son. And if I were coerced into admitting to something that I didn't do to prevent my son from going to jail, well, I'd do it. And that's what Flynn did. What you're saying is, uh, Ray, that first of all, we should set this, that there was a, two phone calls. The first believed from his vacation spot in the Dominican Republic, Michael Flynn had with Kislyak, the Russian ambassador at the time. And in that conversation, there was supposedly some collusion that took place. The field office said there wasn't. It was clear there wasn't. We now know that Flynn asked the Russians not to retaliate to Obama's latest tranche of sanctions against Russia. Many of those were based, by the way, on Russiagate. And that's an interesting question. If the Russiagate case is over, why are those sanctions still on? But that's a whole other, whole other story that we can get into. So uh, there was nothing found uh, untoward in that conversation. Uh, there was no quid pro quos there. He simply asked uh, Russia not to retaliate, and Russia did not retaliate with the sanctions. And he also asked, on behalf of Israel, who had asked him to go there, would you please veto this UN Security Council resolution that the Obama administration had made known that they would abstain on, in other words, let it go through, which would declare Israeli settlements or colonies in the West Bank to be illegal, which they already clearly were under numerous other resolutions. So Obama was doing something, I think, to get back in Netanyahu, who he really couldn't stand, because in the outgoing administration, he decided to let it go through. We're not going to block this one more critical uh, resolution against Israel. And Flynn asked Kislev, could you please veto that? And Russia did not veto it, and it went through. That's all that took place that we know pretty much in that conversation. So as Ray said, they set him up mm. to try to lie. Bill. Uh, the FBI also had access to two separate programs inside NSA that have the exact uh, recordings of those conversations. One of them was the Stellar Wind program, which is the bulk acquisition. And there was another one that's been going on for quite some time that I can't really talk about. 
Okay. Why, but, why not? You talked about the other stuff before. Go ahead. Well, this one is really <laughs> this one is really not in public domain. I okay. See. So I, I can okay. talk about anything in public domain, Joe. That's fine. Now it's interesting you say that because I just saw on Fox News, which uh, for years I've never believed a word of, but now uh, I actually listen to when it comes to the Russiagate stuff. <clears throat> and they and uh, it was reported that this was uh, only an NSA recording between Kislyak and Flynn, but the FBI did it. Therefore, no unmasking would have been necessary. Masking, of course, is when the NSA records a foreign person, but there's also a U.S. person involved in a conversation where they're not legally allowed, so they have to hide that person's name. And there is a process where people in government can ask for that name to be revealed or unmasked. Do you know about that, Bill? Is that what you were just alluding to? This was an FBI uh, tap and not only let an me, NSA one? Let me let me clarify uh, anything that NSA does domestically inside the United States, they do it in cooperation with the FBI. So FBI is uh, in cooperation with them and they've got direct access to all the collected results through the IC REACH program into the NSA databases. So the FBI doesn't have to mask US citizens. No oversight, Joe, none at all. Right. Uh, no attempt at oversight by the uh, FISA court, no attempt at oversight by the intelligence committees. Nobody's looking at it. But the FBI does not have to mask U.S. persons, correct? Wherever they are. In no, the they, they get it directly out of the database, right. So that whole unmasking thing, what, what, that's a minor point in this story, in my view, but it, it needs to be clarified. What exactly, why were all these people asking, including Joe Biden, apparently? Because uh, they don't have direct access to the NSA database. But they, have, they can get the FBI document, can't they? That they has get, the name. They, well, they get the reporting from NSA. So as if, any, if anybody's name was uh, mentioned in a report from NSA, yeah, uh, that was a U.S. citizen. They don't yeah. have a warrant on them. They must yeah. uh, minimize. And so they basically blank out their name and say, Ray, why, why did all these people, Susan Rice, Samantha Power up in New York at the U.N. Uh, and uh, Biden, why do they all want to know who would talk to Kislev? Well, it's well, very clear, Joe. If you, oh. if you look at the timing here, uh, right after the election, all manner of people were asking for unmasking of Flynn. Uh, four top officials from Treasury. Treasury? Okay. Well, what was that all about? Well, they were trying to get Flynn on his links with Turkey and the work that he'd done to Turkey. And he hadn't been, I guess, up completely upfront about being a representative of Turkey. But there are all manner of things they wanted to get Flynn on. The, the more important question was, why? Now, let me try to explain. Flynn knew where all the bodies were buried. <laughs> he was going to come in to, the, to be the national security <laughs> advisor, and they couldn't possibly purge all the files. They couldn't possibly delete or set fire to all the files. Flynn was an ever-present danger, my God. And not only that, but... Uh, you know, he, he talked with Trump about maybe having a more decent relationship with Russia. Wow. What's the reaction of the Mickey Mat? And particularly that cornerstone, the media to that. So it's all very explainable. And then when uh, later on the 29th of December, that conversation with Kislyak was, so it was revealed to whom? To the CIA's best pundit, David Ignatius in the Washington Post, that, that's a felony. Okay? Sure and simple, a felony. Now, for the perspective here, back in the day when Bill and I were on active duty, so to speak, at least CIA, when it got some really sensitive intercepted material, and it involved not only a U.S. citizen, but maybe an allied country, we didn't get the whole schmear. What, was, what did they use? They didn't use blackout. There are easy ways to find out what's under the blackout. They took a razor, okay? They took a razor and cut out that cut thing. Out. For copy. That's what you got. So that's how seriously they took this injunction that came out of the church hearings and all, not to spy on American mm -hmm. citizens. Now, we have 29 people, uh, including the vice president himself, asking NSA, oh, you know, I want that thing about what Flynn said to so-and-so. Mm -hmm. Maybe we'll get something on him. And then we, of course, we know how the FBI set him up by visiting him four days after uh, Trump took office and telling, you don't need a lawyer. No, no, no. We don't. And then saying, <clears throat> doesn't like he lied, but then saying, oh, maybe he lied. And 
I mean, it's so atrocious. It's so, well, it's so obvious what they're trying to do that I'm glad that he has a good lawyer now because she stuck it to this judge. And uh, in my view, uh, the superior judge, the appellate judge, will uh, finally do what's necessary and throw the case, case out. Now, now, the FBI interview, which included Peter Strzok, did not tell Flynn that they had the transcript, that they'd known exactly what he'd said. They kept that from him. Uh, because as uh, Colleen Raleigh, the former FBI special agent who wrote in a piece for Conservative News said, mm -hmm. was it, had they mentioned they had the transcript, uh, he'd want a lawyer there, right? So uh, he, they, he just thought it was a friendly chat. Colleen also points out that Strzok later, mm -hmm. He did the interviewing and the other agent with him took the notes. The other agent then took his notes, wrote up the 302, the official form that will wind up in a courtroom as the FBI statement. Strzok edited that, which again was completely against the procedures. And to go back to the sun. It's falsifying evidence. Falsifying or altering evidence, right? Yeah, that's evidence. That's right. That's evidence in a courtroom. And then why people keep saying the Russia gate true believers, why did Flynn lie? the FBI, if he didn't do anything wrong. Well, as Ray pointed out, it seems that Mueller or somebody in Mueller's team got to him and said, if you don't plead guilty to this minor infraction that is almost never charged, as Colleen pointed out, we're going to go after your son. And if that's true, that is about, pre that's pretty dirty, isn't it? That's a KGB Gestapo attempt approach. That's the same thing. Exactly it is. And one of the techniques that helps them on all this, Joe and, and Bill, as Colleen Raleigh has explained to me, <clears throat> is that the uh, FBI, since the days of J. Edgar Hoover, has never been required to tape testimony like that. They use a 302. What's a 302? Handwritten notes by the interviewer, which can be massaged by his boss or his friend. And, yep. and part of the record, handwritten notes, when just as easily you could record it. So the FBI, you know, is so disingenuous in all this stuff, it's been allowed to not yeah. record these things, and so they play fast and loose with whatever somebody says, and that's part of the problem, not only with Flynn, but with all manner of investigations. Bill? Yeah, no, yeah, no. I, I, I agree with that, you know. I just, uh, I just think that the entire FBI needs to be uh, restructured and, and revamped, and maybe a certain number of people have to take a walk. And the, <laughs> same is true, and the same is true with the entire intelligence community and all those agencies down at least four levels of management. Those people <laughs> need to take a walk. From the top. Yeah. From, from the seventh floor. Yeah. On, on down. Now, um, Trump has a way of exaggerating things we all know, and Ray and I had an exchange about this. I'm being a little more careful, maybe, about claiming that Obama was in on this whole thing on Flynn. We know that he had this meeting. Uh, there's some yep. difference. Uh, Sally Yates, who was the acting attorney general as well, right, at that time, yep. said uh, that people cleared out of the room, and Obama told it was Comey was there, Yates was there, and I'm not sure who else was there. That's it. You call me in Yates, um, that they were going to look into Flynn about the thing we've just been talking about. And Obama was saying, go buy the book and don't have to tell me anything else. Because, of course, the president should supposed to stay away from law enforcement. In fact, I, Trump said the other day, I'm the chief law enforcement officer. That's not my understanding. He's the commander in chief of the troops, but not of law enforcement. You should not cross that wall with the Department of Justice, which he's done. Now, maybe Yates was wrong because Susan Rice has written a memo to herself that's been getting a lot of airplay on Fox, in which she three times says that uh, Obama said do it by the book. Now, first of all, I write emails to myself, so I don't know why people make a big deal out of that. I do it all the time. But it could be that Yates was wrong, that maybe Rice was still present, that she hadn't left the room yet. But here, that doesn't really matter. What is the evidence either Bill or Ray has that you think Obama was directly involved in this Flynn case or in any other aspect of a Brennan operation or any other part of the Russiagate tale that was being spun. I was yeah, asked this. Yeah. Bill, go ahead. Uh, you go first. Mm -hmm. Okay. Pompeo asked me that question. And uh, I said, well, look at who's involved. It's, uh, it's uh, FBI, NSA, CIA, Department of State, Department of Homeland Security, and the DOJ. 
And the only place those come to a point where they can be orchestrated in order to do something is at the White House. So my impression is, although I can't prove it, that Obama was the orchestrator of the, the, not necessarily one who designed it or executed it, but the one who ordered it. Mm -hmm. Ordered. Yeah, I, Go ahead, Ray. I can add to that. Uh, I agree with Bill. Uh, there is some circumstantial evidence of a pretty persuasive kind. It's a change between Peter Strzok and Lisa Page, the attorney for the deputy yeah. director of FBI, McCabe. Uh, and she uh, pretty excitedly says, Peter, I've just been asked to, to prepare talking points uh, uh, by, because, because the POTUS, President of the United States, quote, wants to know everything we're doing, period, end quote. Date, September 2nd, if memory serves, uh, 2016. Well, hello, the whole context was Russiagate. Uh, if he wanted to know everything that they were doing, and McCabe was telling him, or Comey was, well, he uh, certainly had some knowledge of it. The other thing I'll say is this. Many people have said, and I believe this is probably the case, that, that Brennan was the overall uh, archbishop here. Uh, he was the, uh, the overarching leader of this escapade. Now, if that's the case, uh, we know that Brennan had this kind of hold on President Obama. We know that from multiple sources and multiple indicators. For example, when Brennan was trying to resist the publication of the Senate Intelligence Committee report on torture, on CIA torture, Obama bent over backwards, sent his chief of staff to all the meetings to obfuscate, to delete, to, uh, uh, and prevent it from being published. Now, why would he do that? I don't know. I mean, hello, he was going out of office anyway, and, and, but Brennan had this hold on him. Now, the uh, last thing I'll say on this is that it's, it's no secret in Washington uh, how the uh, secret uh, national security state, um, the deep state, if you will, how much power it has. Uh, John McLaughlin, who was acting director of the CIA last, last uh, November, shouted out, Thank God for the deep state, because we show the president the parameters in, into which he can fit his policy. Hello. So what I'm, what I'm saying here is that uh, uh, when Trump was still president-elect, okay, think back to 3 January 2017, uh, Chuck Schumer asked Rachel Maddow, I got something to report, may I come on your show? And she's like, sure, Chuck. So they're on the show, and Rachel says, Oh, Senator Schumer, you said you have something really important to say. And she says, yes, Rachel, it's about President-elect Trump. You know, I thought he was a smart guy. Businessman would, would know which, which uh, fights to pick and all, but he's done something very foolish. Oh, what would that be, Chuck? He's crossed the intelligence community. And they have six ways from Sunday to get back at you. He's done something very, very foolish. Now, you think that was a coincidence? I don't. The 3rd of January, 2017. On the 5th of January, Obama and all these other people that you mentioned before got together in the White House to see how they were going to arrange this campaign against Trump. On the 5th of January, they plotted this visit by Flynn, but they also got their final instructions on how to play the intelligence community assessment, which had been done under Brennan and Clapper's direction. Now, what did that assessment say? It said that Putin said, hack into the DNC, get those emails to me, we wanna help Trump, okay? Now, if it didn't happen, that doesn't matter. That's what the memo said. The very next day, Clapper, Brennan, Comey, and Rogers from the NSA descend on Trump Tower to brief the president, okay? And they say, Mr. President, we have this assessment, and." Sorry, but it says that you wouldn't be president without the Russians helping you a lot. And you know, th that's what it says. And it's gonna be published, it actually it's published today. And then Comey says, gentlemen, I have something even more sensitive to discuss with the president. Uh, could, you, could you leave us alone? Could you? So they leave. And then Comey says, Mr. President, this is very awkward. I, I don't know how to do this, but, but there's this dossier <laughs> and it's scurrilous. 
it's all that way. We can't confirm all of it, but it's out there. The press has them. It says that you cavorted with prostitutes in Moscow. It says all manner of things. So just so you know, Mr. President, it's out there. It's this dossier. Now, Trump, he's a newbie. He, he, he hadn't been in Washington very long, but if, it, if that were I, I would have said, Mr. Comey, go clean out your desk. I know what you're doing. This is Shay Edgar Hoover on steroids. Uh, we have this material, Mr. President. Oh, just so you know, just so you know. Get out of here, clean out your desk. You're gone as soon as I become president. Instead of that, <laughs> he tried to control him, tried like a real estate broker to get him on his side and all that kind of stuff. And it was months later that he had to fire him. So what I'm saying here is that the sphere of the deep state didn't really occur to Trump uh, right off the bat. He yeah. should know enough now, but I think he's still scared. Yeah. And whether he'll let Barr and uh, the U.S. attorney in Connecticut, Durham, who's investigating Russiagate, will they let them go ahead with indictments against these guys that Trump is fond of naming, Brennan, Clapper, Comey, uh, if they decide that indictments are warranted, uh, will Trump chicken out like he has in the past? He's, he's, he's thrown, yeah, he's thrown uh, Nunes under the bus, uh, well, I don't know, but I'm afraid he will. Now, Bill, you're, you're waving a piece of paper. Is that a... a That's the statutes. Those are the statutes that they, uh, Bill says they right. uh, broke. Before, Bill, you get in there, I just want to make one, uh, two points. One, uh, when, Ray, you referred to that text pe uh, message from FBI lawyer Lisa Page to Strzok, that Obama, she was told Obama wants to know everything mm -hmm. that we're doing. The corporate media at the time reported that. Mm -hmm as being in regard to the Clinton server issue, totally independent from Russia. You pointed out to me that that was closed by Comey at that time, and then later reopened when the Wiener uh, uh, laptop was looked at. So you believe that the corporate media was uh, wrong or misleading on purpose, that they, he was really Obama referring to the Russiagate <laughs> stuff that we've all been discussing right now. And the other point <laughs> I wanna make before I turn over to Bill, it's clear that from consortium news's point of view, and I believe all of us here, maybe, I don't know about Bill, because Bill may have voted for Donald Trump and said so, but we, we are uh, certainly not supporters of any party. We don't support Trump or we didn't support Clinton. We don't support Biden or Trump. It's not our role. We are critical of all the parties. And, but we find that what intelligence community or services can do to undermine and to meddle in domestic politics, to undermine a political process is more frightening because it could last longer than whatever Trump may or may not have done in his policies, of which we disagree with almost all uh, at Consortium News. But we are more worried about the intrusion into domestic politics of intelligence services, which are going to be there long after Trump is gone or the next administration, and future candidates or presidents can be meddled with. And that's what we find to be graver. Bill. Yeah, I would just add that if uh, Barr and Durham don't start filing all these charges or some of them against people who are high up in the uh, Obama administration, we can say that they're bought in and that we no longer have a Department of Justice, we have a Department of Just Us continuing, and the us doesn't include the vast population of the United States. It's only a selective elite view in the mostly Democratic Party. Yeah, and I would say this too, um, when Trump coined the phrase, Obamagate. That was about 10 days ago now. Yeah. Oh, no clues. Did you see the mainstream media? My God! First it's Russia Gate, then it's FBI Gate, Deep State Gate. Oh no, Obamagate! And so one of these smart young uh, reporters asked Trump's new spokeswoman, uh, President Trump's talking about crimes. What kinds of crimes have we, we did? <laughs> To my great surprise, she said, well, yeah, I have, I have a listing here. You want me to read it? So she reads out six crimes. And then he says, well, yeah, but those. And then she reads four more. And they're the ones that Bill read. So, you know, Obamagate is real. And uh, it's really realer, much more real than uh, Russiagate. And uh, that's going to be the sticky wicket. Now, I think uh, Barr, uh, Bill Barr, the attorney general, is smart enough uh, to... Uh, Keep his sights, okay? Now, probably he could easily prove Obama had guilty knowledge, Biden himself. But, you know, why go that far? If he gets Comey, if he gets Brennan, if he gets Clapper, uh, these 
these people who deliberately played fast and loose with the Constitution of the United States, that suffices. But the real danger is that he won't. What Bill says, we'll have it forever. Yeah, but like Nixon, okay? This is like Nixon. Yep. Well, it's interesting you say that because uh, that's a heavy charge to make against Obama, that he was like Nixon who had the IRS ordered his enemies. He got involved in all kinds of things he shouldn't have. What happened with the IRS here? And what did they do with the Tea Party and the, uh, and the Occupy group and the religious organizations trying to get the 501c3? What did they do to them? Oh, oh, okay. You know? A whistleblower. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Well, you know, it might be that uh, Barr is saying he doesn't want to give the appearance that he's politicizing this by going after political leaders like Obama or Biden. But then he's going to go after the heads of agencies, maybe, like Clapper, but, Comey. Uh, but Joe, this is a Brennan. real simple question. Did they violate a law? If so, which one? If they did, charge them. Well, it's simply put, but it is more complicated than that, isn't it, Ray? Well, you know, if you look back just 13 months, okay, at Devin Nunes, uh, head of the House Intelligence Committee, um, said he was forwarding eight criminal reforms to the Department of Justice. But of course, they had to go through the White House first, right? Now, he pretty much named the names, and there are a lot of people that we've just been talking about. What happened to those eight criminal referrals 13 months ago? Well, I don't know, uh, but it seems to me that the president chickened out. They didn't go anywhere. They didn't get down to the Department of Justice. So the question now is, will that happen again? Or will Durham and Barr and the president ticked off as he is and with all these other uncertainties and needing to take the offensive, whether he'll follow through this time. If he does follow through, there's going to be a real constitutional uh, issue here. If he doesn't follow through, the Constitution is torn to threads. Well, Ray um, and Bill and Elizabeth, if you have that last question, uh, that might be a good place to end this with the shredding of the Constitution yep. in the balance, because we don't know what's going to happen, whether Durham will, in fact, recommend indictments, whether Trump will go through it or not. Russiagate's story, in terms of its credibility, is pretty much over. But the story overall is not over because the investigation into it continues. And we looked into some of those aspects, including Lucifer 2.0, the Michael Flynn saga, uh, whether Obama was involved or not, the Steele dossier came up. And we did that discussion today with Ray McGovern, former CIA analyst and presidential briefer, and Bill Binney, former technical director of the National Security Agency. And these two guys know a thing or two about the intelligence services. And we really appreciate that they came and uh, lent their expertise to us today. And we'll give another final word to Ray. Yeah, I just want to uh, make a point of thanking Tim Leonard. Yeah. The excellent piece that you edited and posted two days ago, uh, Joe, that goes through uh, the uh, dissection of who this Guccifer 2.0 is. Um, we don't know who he is, and we asked the president to find out uh, back in July of 2017. I wonder if the president even knows who Guccifer 2.0 is, but the time is he ought to find out. Well, I second that, and I did very little editing of Tim's piece, but uh, I was very happy to publish it. Again, thanks, Ray. Thanks, Bill. And thank you, Elizabeth. Welcome. This concludes our episode nine of season two of CN Live. And we thank you for joining us. And join us again for the next show. Get out your notebook. There's more.